Good morning from Canberra and good afternoon and good evening to those of you who are joining us from different parts of the world. I would like to begin by acknowledging and celebrating the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, the first Australians from whose traditional lands I speak today, and pay my respects to elders past and present. My name is Tony Erskine and I'm director of the Coral Bell School of Asia Pacific Affairs here at the Australian National University and I'm honoured to be chair of the 2020 Oceanic Conference on International Studies. I know that I speak on behalf of the OSIS Deputy Chairs, Professor Ben Goldsmith and Professor Evelyn Goh, who's with me this morning, and the OSIS 2020 Organizing Committee, and everyone here at the Coral Bell School, when I say how delighted I am to finally reach the point at which the conference is a reality after 18 months of planning and responding to constantly changing circumstances. I'll introduce our very distinguished keynote speaker, Professor Stephen Walt, in a moment. But first, I'd like to introduce the Vice Chancellor of the Australian National University, Professor Brian Schmidt, to offer an official welcome to the conference. Vice Chancellor. Thank you, Tony, and welcome, everyone. Uh, Tony, thank you very much for your acknowledgement to country. I, too, am on Ngunnawal, uh, Nambri land. I pay my respects to elders past and present. It is a great pleasure to welcome you to the ninth biennial Oceanic Conference on International Studies, uh, hosted this year by ANU, by the Coral Bell School of Asia Pacific Affairs. Uh, my understanding is OSIS is the preeminent conference for international studies here in Australasia, and the inaugural conference was hosted way back in 2004 by ANU. Of course, we did it in person back then, the way we used to do things. Now, the virtual format of this conference is I don't think what we all thought was gonna happen when we agreed to do this. And I don't think we would be able to anticipate the extraordinary context globally in which uh, things are taking place uh, in 2020. And of course, things are still uh, unfolding. It is indeed disappointing that we can't meet in person uh, and I cannot welcome you to our beautiful Bush campus here in Australia's capital city in what is just a glorious spring uh, this year but I do hope we'll be able to get together in the not too distant future. Uh, the format uh, though has some advantages. Uh, our keynote speaker has not had to burn four tons worth of fuel to get here. Uh, we have junior scholars across Australia and from different parts of the world who now are able to join us and I welcome everyone for that. So we need to at least make lemonade from lemons when we're handed lemons. So, uh, we hope that uh, this uh, conference will be a unique chance to reflect has been on a difficult year as it draws a close. And we try to understand and explain the implications for international politics and for our Asia Pacific region of the global pandemic, climate chaos as it's liable to start emerging over the next few decades, the geopolitical tensions that are arising from this and other uh, aspects of life, and of course, an election which took place in my home country and Stephen's home country that has claimed international attention. And indeed, I'm so glad I didn't have to listen to Trump speak for two hours today about how he did not lose the election in Georgia. You have a full program. And from what I can see, there will be ample opportunities for reflection. Throughout this week, two esteemed keynote speeches will speak on very important and timely topics. Uh, we're about to hear from Stephen Walt from Harvard, who will address the world order after COVID. And if I didn't have another meeting to, I would be listening to this because I want to take notes. Uh, and I will uh, let Tony introduce Professor Walt, but from me, it is truly a pleasure to have you join us. And I will be trying to figure out how to get you tennis tickets to get you here in the future, Stephen. We also have ANU's own Professor Benedict Acosta, who will reflect on race, prejudice, and perpetual insecurity in international relations. We also have an award-winning film being screened, which explores bringing enemy groups together in traumatized region of the globe. A distinguished scholars roundtable will ask the significance of the year two, uh, 2020, uh, uh, ask about the significance of the year 2020 for international relations and how we will understand it when we look back at times of crisis in the future. Another roundtable will discuss how early career researchers might best navigate this COVID-19 world and the new world that it is creating. I do hope that you will enjoy this great five-day program of panels and events, and I thank you for the important, impactful intellectual contributions that you will be making. We need you, scholars working in politics and international studies, 
now more than ever. Never thought as a physicist, I would care that much about what you're doing, but believe you, I hang on every word. I look forward to seeing you in the future here on our campus. And Tony, I will hand back to you. Thank you one and all. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor. I was reflecting with Bell School colleagues recently that we were, when we first applied to host this conference, we thought that OSIS 2020 had such a great ring to it. And we had no idea what this year would have in store for us. It's been a challenging year to host and organize an international conference, and that's probably an understatement. Yet you, the participants, have been consistently supportive, enthusiastic, patient, and good humored as we've tried to navigate changing circumstances and uncertainty. And we'd like to thank you sincerely for that. This morning, we're opening a conference with over 90 panels and special sessions and about 390 delegates. It's a great honor to have Professor Stephen Walt with us as part of this official opening. Professor Walt had made plans to be here at the ANU in late June to deliver this lecture and then adjusted those plans to come to Canberra this week. But as we all know, things that we previously took for granted, like overseas travel and international conferences, are not possible yet, although I hope that they will be in the near future. While I'm disappointed that I can't welcome Professor Walt to Australia this time, it's an absolute pleasure to introduce him as the OSIS 2020 opening keynote speaker. Stephen Walt is without question one of the most important and influential theorists within the discipline of international relations. He is Robert and Renee Belfer Professor of International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School. He previously taught at Princeton University and the University of Chicago, where he served as Master of the Social Science Collegiate Division and Deputy Dean of Social Sciences. He's a contributing editor at Foreign Policy, co-editor of the Cornell Studies in Security Affairs, and was elected Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2005. He received the International Studies Association's Distinguished Senior Scholar Award in 2014. His many, many publications include The Origins of Alliances, published in 1987, Revolution and War, published in 1996, Taming American Power, The Global Response to U.S. Primacy, published in 2005, and The Israel Lobby and U.S. Foreign Policy, co-authored with John Mearsheimer in 2007. His most recent book is The Hell of Good Intentions, America's Foreign Policy Elite and the Decline of U.S. Primacy, published in 2018. Professor Wallace is going to speak to us today about the world order after COVID, and I can't think of a better way to open the conference. Professor Walt. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure and an honor for me to be invited to speak to you today. And I want to thank Professor Erskine for the invitation and especially thank the staff at ANU who have made this conference possible in what must have been extraordinary challenging circumstances. Um, as Tony said, I originally intended to be there in person. We all know why that proved to be impossible, but I very much hope we can meet in Asia next year and that the anxieties and tragedies of 2020 will be far behind us by then. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen so that I can show some slides to all of you. Um, as the title suggests, I want to talk a little bit about what the world order is going to look like after the pandemic is done. Uh, this will be somewhat speculative, but not entirely so. I think there are aspects of the future world order we can uh, already anticipate with some confidence. Uh, and here, here are the central arguments I want to make today. Uh, first, that COVID-19 will not alter the basic nature of world politics. This is not a transformative moment where we're suddenly going to see a, a new sudden upsurge, say, in global governance or cooperation. Territorial states will remain the basic building block, and they will continue to compete for power and influence in the future as they have in the past. But at the same time, COVID-19 is accelerating several trends that were underway before the pandemic began. In particular, it's going to reinforce the gradual shift in power toward Asia and lead to a world that is less open and less free than it might have been otherwise. The post-pandemic world order will be shaped primarily by the competition between China and the United States, 
but the form and intensity of that competition is not predetermined. So our challenge, and this is where I'll end, is to build a world order that is stable, relatively peaceful, and that preserves as many gains from cooperation as possible. Let me start by talking a little bit about what was happening before the pandemic began. First and foremost, we'd seen, I think, the end of the unipolar moment, that period where the United States was completely unchallenged, faced no real uh, great power rivals. We've already seen with the uh, rise of China and the resurgence, at least partially, of Russia, that now great power competition is back on the agenda of world politics. Second, we've seen a gradual shift in power and wealth from west to east, and that's perhaps best revealed by this slide, um, which if you look at it, basically shows the share of uh, the world economy occupied by different countries over time. If you see here down in 1950 or so, it's really sort of the peak of American influence. Um, and what we see beginning in the late 1980s is the gradual reemergence of China and India as economic powers as well. Uh, another way to capture this, by the way, is to note that the G7's share of gross world product was 61% in 1990. It's down to 46% today. China's share of gross world product was 1.6% 1 in 1990 it's 16% today. Now, I don't wanna overstate this and suggest that say Asia has now become stronger and wealthier than the West, only that the trend is clearly a shift back towards Asian dominance. Third, we've seen a global backlash against what my colleague uh, Danny Roderick calls hyper-globalization, this notion that we were gonna lower barriers to the movement of goods, money, and people uh, nearly everywhere. And we see this in lots of different ways. It was uh, part of the British decision to take back control by leaving the European Union through Brexit. It's uh, been uh, revealed by the trade war between the United States and China, but also some other trade wars. The partial decoupling of the American and Chinese economies over the last four years and populist opposition to immigration refugees, not just in the United States, but in many other parts of the world as well. We've also seen a trend towards increased authoritarianism around the world. Remember back in the 1990s, people thought that liberal democracy was going to take root and spread everywhere. But in fact, according to Freedom House, a New York based think tank, 2019 was the 13th consecutive year in which the overall level of global freedom declined. We see powerful illiberal trends in places like Poland, Hungary, Russia, Brazil, India, Turkey, and some might argue even in the United States itself. Bottom line is even before the pandemic began, the world was becoming less open, less free, and less dominated by Western powers. So what are the immediate effects of the pandemic? Unfortunately, this is all pretty familiar to all of us. So far, there have been about 66 million confirmed cases worldwide, and that number is only going to keep going up for some time. 1.52 million confirmed deaths worldwide, which is undoubtedly an underestimate, and those numbers are going up every day. The IMF has projected that the world economy is likely to shrink by about 4.4% in 2020, and the International Labor Organization believes that nearly half of the global workforce is at risk of having its livelihood destroyed. Debt levels are soaring in many countries as governments try to deal with the consequences of the pandemic, and some emerging market economies are gonna be very severely affected because they don't have the resources uh, to meet the challenge. Finally, a rapid recovery is unlikely until a vaccine is widely available. As you all know, we've gotten some very encouraging news on that front. Scientific progress to create vaccines has gone much faster than people expected. But there's one, it's one thing to have the uh, success in a lab and success in a clinical trial. It's another thing to make the vaccine sufficiently available to uh, end the pandemic completely. So what is this going to mean for all of us? Well, first and foremost, it means a less open world. COVID-19 revealed that there was another risk to the tightly integrated supply chains that have emerged as part of globalization. 
One risk was already apparent before that. Political relationships could affect those uh, supply chains. So when the Trump administration launched its trade war with China, this had immediate consequences for countries that were dependent on manufacturing in China or dependent on getting particular goods uh, from China as well. What the pandemic has revealed, of course, is that there's yet another risk here. In the case of uh, the spread of disease, sometimes trade gets affected because manufacturing has to shut down in particular countries or because people can't travel or whatever. The point is that COVID suggested there was more vulnerability in a globalized system than we had realized before. The result of this is that states and individual firms are trying to diversify supplies, increase their stockpiles, and bring more production home, especially in critical areas like medical equipment. Uh, William Buter, the former chief economist of Citigroup, suggests that just-in-time economics, which was a hallmark of globalization, is giving way to just-in-case economics with multiple supply chains to ensure continuity in another crisis. COVID-19 has also taught us about the risk of having open movements of people, and international travel declined by 70% in this year, which is a really remarkable number when you think about it. Long term, the fear of future infections may strengthen xenophobia, people worrying that foreign populations are bringing disease, and states are likely to maintain stricter barriers to travel and migration even after the pandemic is over. Uh, as this conference suggests, online meetings may even replace some, not all, but some business travel as people have learned that they can do an awful lot of things via Zoom rather than by getting on airplanes. One caveat here, globalization is not going to end. We're not going to see a return to uh, no or uh, complete mercantilism or anything like that. And some transnational flows may even increase. The flow of information, for example, through digital media and other means may actually increase as a result of the pandemic. So I don't want to overstate this. But nonetheless, it is not quite the seamless, borderless world that many people anticipated we were headed into. Those borders are going to matter more in the future than they have in the past. It's also likely to be a world that is a little less free. In any emergency, states typically limit personal freedoms and civil liberties. Governments impose censorship in wartime, for example, take control of the economy in various ways. So state control almost always increases whenever uh, societies face a genuine emergency. COVID-19 has done exactly that, as we all know. Uh, governments have imposed lockdowns in various places. They've increased surveillance of their own populations. Some countries have imposed mandatory testing on populations or various tracking and tra tracing uh, means so they can uh, plot the pandemic and take action against it. In a few cases, leaders have asked for and received emergency powers, the ability uh, to rule by decree, all of this designed to give a greater capacity for a rapid and effective response. What's interesting here is that the record for both democracies and dictatorships is somewhat mixed. The type of government doesn't seem to be a particularly good predictor of success or failure. So China badly mishandled the pandemic at the very beginning, but since then has done a very good job of bringing it under control. So did North Vietnam, two authoritarian countries. But of course, democracies like New Zealand, Germany, Canada, Australia, and South Korea have also responded very effectively. Some democracies have also done badly, the United States and Great Britain. But of course, some dictatorships have performed poorly as well, Russia, Iran, Belarus as well. So regime type doesn't seem to be a very good predictor. What does seem to be an interesting predictor is having women in leadership positions. This is not a necessary condition because there are some countries without women in leadership positions that have nonetheless done well. But it is striking that New Zealand, Taiwan, Denmark, Scotland, and Germany all did much better than some other democracies led by men. That might be just a correlation, it might be causal, but it is pretty intriguing to me at least. Bottom line, 
Some of these restrictions are going to get lifted once the pandemic is over, but others are likely to remain in place, even if they're not really related to public health. Some governments may in fact discover that having the capacity to monitor their populations in the ways that they've been doing recently is useful for other purposes. So bottom line here is I think we're going to see a somewhat less free world as a result of the pandemic than we would have otherwise. Very importantly, the long-term impact is going to vary a lot by country. First of all, the longer the pandemic lasts, the greater the economic scarring. And by that, I mean uh, businesses uh, going bankrupt, going out of business. And therefore, once the pandemic is over, they can't simply rehire their workers because they're no longer in existence. And the more of that that occurs, the slower the recovery is likely to be once the pandemic is over. Uh, school closings mean students don't make as rapid educational progress, don't learn as much, which means that human capital formation is not as rapid or great in a country, and that means lower long-term economic productivity. Lockdowns uh, almost certainly generate greater spousal and child abuse. Child abuse doesn't necessarily get detected because students aren't going to school in person. And that, over time, was likely to result in a higher incidence of mental health problems within a society, especially the longer the lockdown lasts. And finally, very interestingly, there's really quite convincing scientific evidence that suggests that the level of stress undergone by women when they're pregnant has long-term and significant effects on the health of their children and the educational achievement levels of those children. Well, being in a pandemic, being in a lockdown, et cetera, has got to be incredibly stressful. And therefore, one is likely to have some long-term effects as a result of that as well. Finally, the effects of the pandemic are clearly reversing decades of progress towards gender equality, especially in the workforce, as the burden of dealing with the consequences for example, children that now need to be schooled remotely has been falling disproportionately upon women rather than men. For working women, of course, this has obvious effects on their uh, ability to advance professionally. And this is true in uh, lots of different places. The point I wanna emphasize, however, is that all countries are gonna experience each of these effects, but the negative impact is gonna be greater in those countries where the pandemic has been most severe and where it's lasted the longest. That's bad news for countries like the United States or Great Britain and probably some others. It's good news for countries like China, which have managed to get past this quickly. I would remind everybody that China is now expected to grow by about two and a half percent this year, much lower than they have in recent years, but still positive, while the United States is expected to shrink by about 4.3%. So what does this mean? Well, the one final thing I'll say before talking a little bit about where I think the world is headed is just to remind everyone that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Nationalism and great power competition were increasing before the pandemic. And despite clear incentives to cooperate, obvious reasons for countries to pull together and share information and do as much as they could together, most countries have chosen to go it alone in response. The United States, of course, cut off funding to the World Health Organization. Russia, China, the United States, and India all declined to contribute to a European proposal for a joint vaccine research fund. States have sought to protect national vaccine research efforts and get access to a vaccine ahead of others. The United States chose not to participate in the COVAX initiative that was designed to make vaccines more readily available for the developing world. Uh, around the world, there's been very little coordination on travel restrictions. Countries didn't coordinate when they were gonna close their borders uh, with others. Uh, they just did it on their own. Of course, the United States and China have each blamed each other uh, in various ways. And China has retaliated harshly after Australia proposed that there be an independent inquiry into the origins of the virus. There is one partial exception here I do want to note. There has been substantial transnational cooperation among scientists and pharmaceutical companies to produce vaccines, and that's maybe the one bright spot of international cooperation in this. But nonetheless, as you might expect, most countries 
preferred to rely on self-help. And meanwhile, in the midst of all this, conflicts have continued in Syria, Afghanistan, Yemen, Ukraine. There's been a border clash between India and China, wars continuing in Somalia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, and Ethiopia, etc. So none of that, uh, none of those aspects of international politics have been altered. So what's the future global order likely to look like? Well, I believe the post-pandemic order will be shaped primarily by growing rivalry between the United States and China. These are the two most powerful countries on the, uh, on the planet and the two most powerful countries inevitably eye each other warily because each is the other's greatest potential threat. They also have somewhat conflicting grand strategies. Uh, China over time, I believe, would like to reduce the American role, especially in Asia, so that it no longer has to worry about uh, an American military or security presence in the Pacific. The United States, for its own reasons, would like to retain that uh, set of relationships and prevent China from becoming the dominant power in Asia. This inevitably uh, is going to lead to a considerable amount of friction between the two countries. Europe, in my judgment, will continue to be preoccupied primarily by internal issues, but will not be able to remain neutral and at the same time still rely on American protection. Now, the European Union's foreign minister, Joseph Borrell, recently said that Europe needs to avoid being squeezed between the United States and China. But I don't think it will be possible for Europe to remain neutral while at the same time expecting NATO to exist and the United States to still play a key role in European security. If, that, if Europe wants that to continue, they will eventually have to line up more or less with the United States. Russia will continue to decline relative to the other major powers, but it will not disappear. It will retain influence in a number of areas, especially close to its own territory. And as I said before, overall power and influence is likely to be shifting towards Asia. So where are the two great powers likely to compete most? Well, obviously they're gonna compete uh, for military advantages and military capabilities. This is already underway with each side focusing more and more of their military preparations uh, designed to deal with the other. There will be competition over maritime access in Asia. Uh, China would like uh, the world to accept the South China Sea as part of its own territorial waters. Both the United States, its partners in Asia, and the other countries that border the South China Sea oppose that initiative. Uh, Taiwan is an obvious flashpoint. Uh, the United States is not likely to end its support uh, for Taiwan, uh, and China is not likely to abandon its claims that, China, that Taiwan is a part of uh, China's sovereign territory. There will be considerable competition for leadership in advanced technology, whether it's 5G, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, clean energy, or which digital standards will be adopted uh, around the world. The two states, of course, will also compete for influence in key countries and in international organizations. And this, by the way, I think is gonna be the most likely shift uh, when uh, Joe Biden becomes president. The United States will be increasingly active in trying to shore up those diplomatic relationships and participating more constructively in international organizations than the Trump administration has. And finally, there will be uh, a competition over definitions of human rights and accusations over which country is respecting them uh, most successfully. Uh, the United States will have its own series of complaints directed at China and China will have uh, its own responses as well. So this is going to be an intensely competitive relationship. But at the same time, there are a series of issues where the United States, China, and of course many other countries do need to cooperate. First and most obviously is ending the current pandemic and preparing for future ones. I would just remind everybody that since 1980, uh, we've seen the AIDS epidemic, the SARS uh, pandemic, the Ebola uh, problems, MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, and now of course the coronavirus. There will be new ones. There is every reason to believe that this kind of trans-species uh, 
viruses will reemerge in other places or reemerge again. And it would be nice if we could learn from this experience and be much better prepared for the next one. Obviously, the two states need to cooperate on climate, which is probably the single most important uh, problem uh, that mankind currently faces. Uh, they should be working together to enhance nuclear security, to ensure that there are no unauthorized uses of nuclear weapons or uh, no use of nuclear weapons whatsoever. And of course, that nuclear materials, either weapons themselves or the materials that could be used to make them remain under very reliable custody. Uh, there's also, I think, a, a widespread agreement that the global trade regime needs to be re revised, that it's not performing as people hoped it would, uh, that there are some new issues, many of them involving uh, digital governance that the existing WTO regime doesn't cover very well. Um, and so one obvious area where the United States and China and others should cooperate is reforming the WTO. Uh, related to that, of course, negotiating a set of rules of the road, perhaps only informally, for dealing with cyberspace, which remains a realm in which there's really hardly any uh, normative agreement in the world of what sorts of activities are permissible and where are the red lines of, uh, that states should not cross. Uh, efforts to negotiate that, either formally or informally, I think badly needed. The bottom line here is that even in an era where there's likely to be considerable competition between these two uh, large countries, preserving the benefits of cooperation is also important. Indeed, to do that in an era of rising competition could be the major challenge of the post-COVID world. So the big question is how? How do we do that? Here I want to talk a little bit about some work I'm now engaged with with my colleague Danny Roderick. And this starts with the recognition that a system of interdependent states, and that's what we have today, uh, does require some set of rules. And those rules or institutions inevitably reflect, reflect to a large extent the underlying balance of power and the interests of those major powers. What we've pro I proposed is starting with a, what we call a meta regime where states would agree to a fourfold classification of policies without necessarily agreeing in advance on which policies belong in what category. And let me lay this out very briefly. Category one would be a prohibited category, principles or actions that most states support and actions that most or all agree are illegitimate or wrong. And some of these are already well established. The UN Charter establishes many of these things. Uh, the acquisition of territory by force is regarded as illegitimate. Diplomatic immunity, there are certain things you're not supposed to do to foreign representatives. Beggar thy neighbor economic policies, policies where I can only make gains by forcing you to suffer losses. All of these are proscribed in existing international institutions. So there's some category of actions that states might agree are illegitimate or wrong. By the way, that doesn't mean that there are never violations of those rules, only that violating those rules is understood to be wrong and carries reputational or other consequences. All right, category two is the area of cooperative negotiations and mutual adjustments. And this is, of course, a big part of what happens in international politics all the time. Trade negotiations, arms control, border adjustments. These are all places where states disagree, but may be able to reach cooperative solutions through negotiations, each adjusting each other's behavior to remove what's bothering the other side in exchange for mutual concessions as well. So a second category would be er things that could be perhaps resolved through negotiation and adjustment. If those mutual adjustments aren't possible, if no deal can be struck, then it's also understood in some areas, states will take independent, well-calibrated actions to protect their interests. Again, this happens all the time in international politics too. But the key here is that states would agree that those independent responses should be proportionate, designed only to address potential harms and not to gain a unilateral advantage over the others. And let me illustrate this by talking briefly about the case of Huawei, which of course the United States has been going after in a number of ways in recent years. In our framework, Banning the use of Huawei switching systems, Huawei 5G, within the United States, 
could be justified on national security grounds, given uncertainties over whether or not that might introduce various vulnerabilities. You could also, uh, I think, justify encouraging close allies not to use a Huawei for the same sort of national security type reasons. So that would fit uh, under category three, independent responses taken to protect one's own interests. But again, the action should be proportionate to the potential harms. You're not using the technology because you're worried about a particular vulnerability. At the same time, what the United States has also done, namely banning the selling of chips to Huawei, chips that they need to build their equipment, is a much harder to justify on pure national security grounds. That looks more like trying to cripple Huawei across the board. That's much more like category one, essentially a beggar thy neighbor policy as well. So in our framework, um, there might be a possibility of mutual adjustment in category two. Some of the actions taken against Huawei would be regarded as legitimate. Others would not be. They would fall under category one as well. There's a fourth category, by the way, which is the domain of multilateral governance. This is where bilateral actions, even bilateral agreements between two countries have significant spillover effects on third parties. And the only way to completely resolve them is to eventually embed them in a larger multinational uh, agreement. All right, what are the advantages of thinking about this this way? Well, instead of a simple dichotomy between sort of rivals uh, or allies, rivalry and cooperation, this framework encourages us to distinguish between areas where there's considerable agreement, areas where differences exist but might be resolvable through negotiation, areas where adjustment isn't possible and each state will act to protect its core interests, but ideally without escalating the level of conflict and then finally, those areas where viable solutions require a multilateral response. You could imagine this framework being used to structure a series of discussions between the United States and China, for example, where we start by trying to figure out where are the areas we already agree, where might we be able to adjust each other's behavior in a way that would leave us both better off. What are some areas where that's not going to be possible, but perhaps we can avoid the worst set of independent responses. And then finally, those areas where bilateral arrangements are not going to be sufficient and other countries have to be brought in. This framework accepts the reality of Sino-American rivalry, but looks for ways to preserve joint gains, to minimize risks, and most optimistically, to try and build greater trust and understanding over time. But remember, in some areas, the competition is going to continue. It's going to continue to be zero sum. And of course, states are going to be pursuing unilateral advantages. Finally, this framework is also applicable to relations with uh, allies and neutrals as well. One would assume that with one's allies, there are more issues that end up in categories one and two, things we agree not to do to each other or areas where we're able to adjust uh, according to negotiations and relatively few things land in category three. With your adversaries, of course, it's just the reverse. More things will end in category three, fewer of them up in category one. And just to repeat, this isn't going to eliminate all conflicts. Major powers are still going to pursue advantages in some, uh, some ways, but our goal is to try and think of as many ways to carve out zones of cooperation that might otherwise be lost. So where do I think this will lead us? Well, if I gaze into my crystal ball, I think we see a world where there's a relatively thin order, a relatively thin set of institutions for most security questions. There's only limited cooperation through norms and shared institutions at the global level. And that's primarily because the two major powers are gonna find it very difficult to reach large, substantial, dense agreements on security questions you'll have a somewhat thicker global order to manage economic issues. The United States and China will want to maintain uh, aspects of their economic relationship, and that's going to require uh, agreements and embedding those in institutions. Uh, certainly any kind of uh, global accord to address climate change is going to have to have lots of dimensions to it. It will be relatively thick as well. 
So a thin order on security issues, a thicker order on economic and climate issues, and the United States and China each likely to lead bounded, limited, not global orders, and comparatively thick orders in both the economic and security realms. Both states will have partners with whom they compete, I'm sorry, with whom they cooperate on defense arrangements, intelligence, other security issues, and both states will have partners where the economic relationships are denser and the uh, institutional framework that underpins them is also denser as well. Let me just summarize this up uh, with a few final thoughts. Uh, to repeat, the rivalry between the United States and China will be the defining feature of the future world order. It's not going to be the only thing, but it's going to be, I think, the central uh, set of relations. Managing that competition requires that the United States and China accept a level of global influence for each other that reflects the underlying balance of power. If the United States tries to deny Beijing its rightful share, there's going to be trouble. But of course, if Beijing tries for more than its rightful share, there's likely to be trouble as well. And striking that balance is going to be a major diplomatic challenge. A first step is that the United States and China should avoid challenging each other's domestic legitimacy appearing to seek regime change, appearing to argue that there's no possibility of peaceful coexistence, or suggesting that the only goal must be some kind of decisive victory over the other. Uh, the more that either Beijing or the United States uh, talks in those terms, the harder it will be to carve out those zones of cooperation that still need to be maintained. And finally, I think this implies that emerging global norms are going to have to allow for a wider range of institutional diversity among states. Again, 25 or 30 years ago, I think there was an illusion of a kind of one size fits all world where everyone would converge upon some form of liberal democratic capitalism with sort of mild cultural variations. I think that uh, was never likely to happen, is certainly not likely to happen now, and therefore we're going to have to be willing to live with much greater uh, level of institutional diversity around the world than people anticipated uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Now, in closing, I remain enough of a structural realist to believe that the United States and China will be rivals for a long time and that their competition is going to cast a very long shadow over the rest of world politics. It's not going to determine every aspect of world affairs, and both medium and smaller powers will retain some agency and some capacity to maneuver between the United States and China. But more importantly, the inevitability of Sino-American competition does not lead to any preordained conclusion. It doesn't mean war is inevitable or necessarily even a return to Cold War levels of ideological confrontation and political competition. What sort of world order we get, and whether the United States, China, and others are able to cooperate on certain key issues, even as they compete on others, will depend on the choices that leaders make in the years to come. And it's possible, in fact, it doesn't require much effort to imagine both darker and brighter futures. I think it is our responsibility as scholars and practitioners of international affairs to help our respective countries create the most hopeful, safe, and prosperous world, po world possible. I want to thank you all for your attention, and I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you for that. Uh, my name is Evelyn Goh, and I'm the Shedden Professor of Strategic Policy Studies here at the ANU. Uh, it's my pleasure to um, chair the question and answer session for this opening um, session of, of um, OSIS. Steve, um, thank you for a wide ranging and um, thoughtful, um, as well as I think um, moderately hopeful, at least not entirely pessimistic um, sketch of the world that we've got today and the one going forward. Um, the question of future world order, of course, is one that um, preoccupies most IR scholars today, I would imagine. Um, and 
as we slide into the Q&A session, thank you, Steve, for leaving us about 35 minutes in this session where we can open up to questions. Could I encourage our audience, please, as this is a webinar format, to write your questions into the Q&A box, not the chat box, but the Q&A box, where we will, we've got a team who will monitor the questions and I'll um, try and reflect as many of your questions as possible in this session and the rest of this session. Now, just to kick things off, Steve, if you don't mind, um, perhaps I could um, highlight two or three points that have come out of your wide ranging talk that um, may be helpful for us to think about in, in the Q&A session. Um, first of all, within, I think we, we've all received your message very clearly um, that, you know, that the more things change, the more things see, seem to have stayed the same. Um, one particular point that stood out in one of your earlier slides about where the world is today is that notion that you, you talked in the context of Europe, you know, that um, the Europeans face a dilemma that they can't continue to rely on the United States while at the same time wishing to remain neutral. And I suppose for those of us in the Asia Pacific, this of course is a much more intense and much more urgent dilemma faced in this region as well. So a degree of commonality there. Um, secondly, it also struck me that, you know, you, you've painted a very convincing picture um, which I think most of us here will agree with as well, of power redistributing towards Asia, certainly. Um, but at the same time, also in a world in which we've had, uh, we, we see rising nationalism and rising great power competition. It seems to me that the second set of observations um, make life extremely difficult for great powers, um, even when they are great powers in the part of the world where power is moving towards. Um, nationalism, of course, is not something which has been on the rise simply within the US and China. It is on the rise across the world. Um, this makes it difficult for great powers, be it the United States or China, uh, easily to exercise effective power, to, to exercise influence, if you like, um, in their chosen regions um, as well as elsewhere. Um, the fact of growing great power competition, as we saw in the Cold War, simply increases the leverage of other states to wag the tail of the great power dogs. So it seems to me that exercise of influence for the US and China particularly is going to become trickier, even as we have the distribution of power. Now, um, and finally, just a third observation, that intriguing slide at the end about options for future order. Um, and of course, I think you're absolutely right that we have elements of a thin order, elements of a thick order across issue areas. And at the same time, that bounded um, comparatively thick orders within each of the US and China's spheres of influence. Um, my take on that is that we're actually going to see a world order in which we've got all three of those elements coexisting. They're not alternatives. Um, they are actually overlapping. Um, elements of this complex new order that we've, we've got to be dealing with. Um, I, I leave those sort of observations on the table. Um, hopefully this will help to widen out the range of thoughts from our audience as well. I'd like to, if it's okay with you, Steve, keep those there and then go turn to a couple of questions that have come up in the Q&A. Is that okay? Perfect. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple of questions which are interrelated. Um, one comes from George Lawson, my colleague at the ANU, um, asking whether the rivalry between the US and China now amounts to a new Cold War, and how likely is it that that rivalry will turn hot? Um, in a related vein, Gavin Mount also asks about the economic interdependence of that US-China relationship, and whether that economic interdependence, um, what the prospects are that that might help to mitigate against geostrategic risk. So those two interrelated. Okay, I'm going to take them in reverse order. I mean, the, the, the debate on to what extent economic interdependence is a barrier to international conflict has been going on, you know, for a century or more. Uh, and I think the, the sort of consensus view of this is yes, um, 
when states are tightly intertwined economically, uh, that is a partial inhibitor of conflict, but it is not an absolute barrier. And we all can sort of quote the canonical examples of the exceptions, the most obvious one being World War I, uh, you know, where you know, famously uh, it was said before the war uh, that you know, a war between the European great powers would be an economic disaster and therefore it won't happen. That was the argument of you know, Norman Angel's uh, great illusion. And of course, that didn't prevent the war. He was right. It was a complete economic disaster for Europe, but it didn't stop it uh, from happening. Um, so I, I think that yes, uh, for both the United States and China, the fact that the uh, economies have been intertwined in various ways has been a partial barrier, um, but it's not one that I would want to depend on. Uh, you don't want to necessarily depend that either you know, Chinese industries or Wall Street will necessarily determine what either side does going forward. And by the way, the more you believe in that argument, the more you might worry about the partial decoupling of the two economies, which then might reduce, uh, reduce the cost as well. But I guess my, my bottom line there is it's not a sufficient uh, reason to relax just because uh, it would have enormous economic consequences. Uh, given that there are various security issues that the two countries are divided over. Uh, second question, is this a new, new Cold War? Um, it's very easy to sort of fall back on that, the Cold War analogy, but I think there are sort of two obvious uh, differences. Uh, one is that, uh, you know, if, as we look back, uh, the Soviet Union was not nearly as formidable a rival as China could easily be. Right, the Soviet Union, the uh, Soviet economy was, uh, you know, never more than 60% of the American economy. Um, and China is likely to have a, an economy larger than that of the United States. Something the United States, by the way, has not faced uh, since 1900 or so. The United States has been the world's largest economy for 120 years. And I think Americans are very accustomed to that. Now, I should also add that GDP alone is not the only thing you want to think about here. It's not just the size of your economy. It's also how much of a surplus you can generate with that uh, and a surplus that you can use for other uh, purposes, including uh, the amassing of military power. And everyone should remind themselves that the United States still spends substantially more every year on national security and has substantially more capable military forces than China does, in part because American per capita income is much higher than that of China, and therefore there's a greater surplus that can be used uh, for government purposes. The second uh, big difference, of course, is that the uh, Cold War had a very pronounced ideological dimension to it. And, uh, the, you know, we really did see it as uh, capitalist democracy versus Marxism-Leninism. Uh, China is every bit as capitalist, some would argue more capitalist than parts uh, of the West now. So there isn't quite the same ideological uh, element to it. I think we've seen in the last couple of years that that ideological thing is starting to be reintroduced. Right? Uh, if, you find, if you see what Secretary of State Mike Pompeo likes to talk about, you know, the, the problem is the Chinese Communist Party. And the, com the problem is uh, Chinese authoritarianism. The problem is uh, that it's the free world versus these, uh, these dictators. That's starting to uh, reintroduce an ideological dimension, but not quite at the same level as I think uh, the Soviet Union with its own embrace of a sort of universalist ideology. Cold War was, you know, uh, the universalism of liberal democracy versus the universalism of Marxism Leninism. Thus far, uh, China is not presenting itself as a model for the entire world. It's not telling the entire world, you have to all become one party state capitalist regimes. That's the future. Uh, that may come eventually, but it hasn't happened yet. And that uh, thus far has kept the ideological dimension of this rivalry at a much more muted level. Thanks, Steve. Um, I'd like to move to a question from my, uh, Ben Zela, who is again, one of my colleagues here at the ANU. I know uh, Ben quite well. <laughs> hi, hi, Ben. <laughs> um, 
Ben's question is that you mentioned the need for both the US and China to avoid challenging each other's domestic legitimacy um, in order to remove barriers to cooperation. Um, what do you think the barriers are to this kind of approach in Washington particularly? Is it possible to adopt this kind of cooperative approach accepting CCP role in China in particular in mainstream American politics? And I think Ben's question relates to you know, something that, that many of us have, have, have often thought that, you know, one of the biggest challenges in that bilateral relationship between the US and China is in fact trying to get the US to share some degree of power with, with China. Um, what do you think, Steve? Uh, so I think this is actually a perennial problem in uh, American diplomacy. And I think it's a huge challenge for other countries and not just uh, American adversaries, uh, but even for our allies. Uh, and the problem is, you know, who exactly speaks for the United States? Is it the Secretary of State? Is it the President? Is it the President's Twitter account? Is it uh, a Senator? Uh, how about a Senator who's thinking about running for President in the next election? So one of the difficulties that seems to me that, uh, you know, China will face is that in the uh, American foreign policy world, there will be many different voices, and some of them will have the most extreme view of U.S.-Chinese relations, which may not represent the official views of the State Department, the views of the President, the views of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. It's just them out there talking. But how do you know which is the voice that's really telling you what American policy is or, or is likely to be? And, and I think Ben's question points to a real problem. We have such a cacophony of voices in the United States, it's very difficult for other countries to figure out exactly what it is the United States really does want. Uh, and it's very easy for people in other countries to sort of take the most extreme views and assume that that's really representative of where the United States is coming from. Um, that said, so that's, that's problem number one. That said, there has been, I think, a real sea change in American attitudes towards China, uh, and that's true in some other countries as well. Uh, if you go back 25 or 30 years, there was, I think, a hope, not that, the, that China wouldn't emerge and be more of a competitor, but it would basically be socialized into a Western-designed order, would it gradually evolve in a liberal democratic direction, uh, it would develop economically, it would develop a middle class, that middle class would want political power, eventually it would become a multi-party democracy. And then if you really believe your democratic peace theory, everything's fine, because of course democracies uh, always get along so, so well. Uh, I think that was uh, the hope, uh, it turned out not to be true, and what you've seen uh, happen over the past uh, five to ten years is greater agreement uh, within the foreign policy world in the United States that China is a serious competitor that has to be taken seriously. Uh, previously, and this gets back to the earlier question, you could argue that many parts of the business community wanted to continue to make money dealing with China and didn't want to treat it as a competitor. Um, the national security community was getting worried, but the business community wasn't. I think that has now changed. Um, and it's part, partly changed because China has proven to be a more formidable economic competitor, but also because of some of China's economic practices uh, as well. Last but not least, and I probably don't need to explain this to anyone in Australia, but the conduct of Chinese diplomacy over the past 10 years has become increasingly assertive, increasingly coercive, uh, in, in the reliance on what has been called wolf warrior diplomacy has alarmed other countries who might have been uh, perfectly content to see China become wealthier and more influential, but now have every reason to worry about exactly how that additional wealth and power is going to be wielded. Thank you, Steve. I'm going to um Take the next question live, if this works, um, from Catherine Goetzer. Um, Catherine, if you're there, I've given you talking rights. Yes, okay. Ask your question. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Um, well, thank you very much, Stephen. It was really an interesting um, talk, and I took a lot of notes for my students for next semester international cooperation um, unit. So um, 
it will feed it immediately into into thinking about international cooperation. My question was. Um, so the, you, this, this framework that you developed, uh, I thought was highly interesting with the categories and then the resulting thin and thick layers of cooperation and interaction. I think that's a very nice way to um, represent um, these ordering politics, as I would call them. But um, they nicely align in the case of the China-US relations. Now, in the case of sort of middle powers like Australia or some of European countries, they do not align that nicely. And um, what we can observe, especially in Australia at the moment, is that then other factors play a role in sort of the decision making over what kind of policies to pursue and what kind of cooperation to pursue. And very clearly in the Australian case, it is um, the alliance with uh, the United States. It is wanting to be part of the Western world and not of the Chinese world and wanting to be part of the white, um, uh, white Asia part. Um, so there are normative or cultural normative ideas that start um, becoming having a sort of pivotal role in this decision making and uh, creating friction as we can see at the moment. So how would you uh, conceptualize these factors? So the, the um, um, to say it very bluntly, so the, the normative, cultural, racialized, very often gendered aspects of international ordering politics. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question, and I probably will not give a fully satisfactory answer to it, but uh, let me try to clarify what uh, Danny, Roderick, and I are trying to do here. The, the four categories are sort of agnostic with respect to content. Um, that is to say, they're, or they're, they're minimalist with respect to content. It's simply a, a way of trying to categorize different policies without saying what countries are going to sort of put in each box. We have some ideas about what they might put in each box, but, um, but those are just our ideas. They, they don't have any real content to it. And therefore, what uh, some states might be willing to agree to uh, forego, you know, put in category one, here's some rules that things we're not going to do any longer, uh, versus uh, things uh, that would go in category three, uh, we don't think we can uh, reach an agreement on this, so we're going to defend our, our interests as we define them independently. How that gets answered is determined very much by the preferences of different countries. Preferences are going to reflect precisely the things you mentioned, the sort of cultural normative environment in different places, which, by the way, isn't necessarily fixed, right? So I could imagine... Um, Australia answering that question at one point in 2020 and answering uh, some of these issues differently in 2030 or 2040 uh, as well. I don't think those are, are necessarily fixed. We're trying to simply uh, come up with a way of separating things um, from either, you know, it's we're, we're rivals and competing across the board or we're friends and collaborating across the board and suggesting that no, in fact, even in a, in a uh, relatively hostile and competitive relationship, there are some areas where you might be able to agree not to do certain things to one another because it's too dangerous. All right, so there's some things we do agree on. In the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union agreed on non-proliferation. They didn't like it, so they supported the NPT together. And they also signed an agreement to prevent incidents at sea, to prevent collisions between US and Soviet naval vessels because they understood that was dangerous too. So even in the Cold War, there were some agreements between the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, but your basic point that, you know, actually what goes in each of those boxes and how things might get resolved is not, uh, not something that's going to be determined by Donnie or A. It's going to be determined by, um, by individual countries and therefore will reflect their own internal politics and values. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. And, and thanks, thanks, Catherine for joining us there. Um, I'm going to, if possible, turn next to Asima Rabani, who has a question also about Steve's framework. Asima? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, Hi. very well. Thank you uh, for your um, informative talk. Um, I just have a question. 
that um, and that question comes from the way Australia and um, China relations are going these days. Uh, I feel that somehow uh, China is seeking a hegemon status and some of the privileges that come with the hegemon status. And uh, maybe it's time when you look, when we look at your framework, it seems to be like it's time to accept that it is a rise, rising hegemon and it, uh, it is seeking certain privileges and we may um, can accord it certain privileges and in return ask it to actually perform some of the responsibilities of a hegemon. Um, well, uh, there's a couple of points to make here. I think that it's simply as a matter of, uh, you know, sort of practical politics and, and realism, uh, the world has to understand that China will uh, exert more influence than it did in 1990. When you're 1.6% of the world economy, you have less influence than when you're 16% of the world economy. When you have no military capabilities to speak of, uh, except a very rudimentary uh, nuclear force, um, and uh, you have one level of influence in the world, and once you've started to develop some capacity to project power elsewhere, that goes up, etc. Uh, when China was backward in almost every area of technology, it uh, had a smaller voice in international affairs than when it's become a competitive power in a number of areas of technology. Uh, and to pretend that China will enjoy the same influence it exerted in the Maoist era today is just not realistic. Uh, the question is, what forms is that influence going to take and how, um, how extreme uh, might it be? And you use the word hegemon, and I think that, that gets at it very neatly. Um, to oversimplify a little bit, uh, I agree with my friend and colleague uh, John Mearsheimer about this. I think China is trying to establish a hegemonic position in much of Asia. By hegemonic, I don't mean that they want to conquer all of Asia and run it like a big formal empire. I don't think the Chinese could do that, and I don't think they aspire to do that. Uh, but they would like a relationship somewhat uh, akin to the relationship the United States has had in the Western Hemisphere, where there are no other major powers there, uh, and where the United States gets an enormous amount of deference from other countries in its immediate region, even if they don't like it very much or don't always like it very much. Um, and for the Chinese, that means trying to push the United States out of Asia, because if the United States remains closely tied to Japan, South Korea, Australia, has a growing relationship with India, growing relationship possibly with Vietnam, et cetera, it's gonna be very difficult for China to have that kind of deference from all of its immediate neighbors. It will get some for economic reasons, for other reasons, but it won't have the kind of relationship the United States has in much of Latin America as well. So that's one of the reasons I think there's going to be real friction between the United States and China. China would like to be in a hegemonic position and the United States will want to prevent that from happening. Uh, if for no other reason than to make sure that China has to spend a lot of time worrying about its own neighborhood or its own region and is less able to project power and influence into other parts of the world. Uh, including, by the way, possibly the Western Hemisphere, which is something the United States would be pretty uh, sensitive about. Let me just add one other point uh, about this. I have um, been thinking for the last year or so, and I wrote a foreign policy column about this, is you could argue that the United States under Trump and, uh, and China under President uh, Xi Jinping have both been engaged in a relentless competition to see who could lose influence faster. Um, because in some respects, you know, the, the handling of the pandemic should have been a great opportunity for China. Uh, okay, they mishandle things at the beginning, but then they really get on it. They seem to have brought it under control, etc. Meanwhile, the United States has performed very badly. We don't look like we know what we're doing. This would have been a great opportunity for China to sort of say, look, you want to sort of be our friend. You want to be close to us because we're a competent rising power that really knows what it's doing. And at the same moment that the United States allowed this opportunity, right, and also, by the way, with Trump picking fights with lots of other countries, including America's friends, instead, the Chinese decided now was the moment to adopt a very belligerent, very confrontational, 
very, you know, what's mine is mine, what's yours is negotiable approach to dealing with other countries. And the inevitable result, of course, has been a backlash, more countries wanting to be close to the United States, countries in Asia starting to cooperate more with each other than they have uh, previously as well. So as I say, you know, both countries have managed to do whatever they seem to be able to think of to reduce their own influence uh, as well. Uh, and if either one of them, you know, uh, smartens up, uh, they'll gain uh, some advantages in the future. Thank you, Steve. Um, for the next question, I'm going to log roll a number of related questions into a general theme of, you know, the role of other players in um, the Asia Indo-Pacific in the coming world order. Um, we've got a number of related questions. Um, for example, one from Jonathan Pickering on um, what your thoughts might be on how the changing roles of other states in the Indo-Pacific, especially India and Japan, might affect the dynamics of US-China rivalry. We also have a question from Keshav Giri um, about whether you think, given the de decreasing footprint of the US abroad, there could be a more complex world order where countries like India and Australia also have more roles to play. Um, related to these questions are, are others that specifically ask for your view about how Australia would fit in this world of growing US-China rivalry, for example, that from Derek McDougall. Um, so if, I guess that the common theme here is, you know, how about the rest, particularly the, 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 the countries in the Asia and Pacific that we think of broadly within the middle power category? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I, I'm gonna say what I think should happen, uh, but I also think it's what will happen which is not always the, uh, always the case. I mean, it goes back to the earlier question about comparing this with the Cold War. I mean, as I indicated there, uh, China is likely to be a far more formidable competitor than the Soviet Union was. Um, and that's in part just by sheer size, uh, the size of its economy, size of its population, uh, but also the fact that unlike the Soviet Union, which was with the exception of military power uh, also sort of technologically and economically backward and didn't trade with anyone else, didn't have economic dealings outside the Warsaw Pact of any substantial uh, amount. Uh, China is fully engaged in the world economy. It trades with lots of other countries. It trades, uh, at, it invests in other countries. It has launched the Belt and Road Initiative, which is probably not as a uh, major or successful, you know, strategic initiatives as they would like you to think, but still is significantly different than anything the old Soviet Union ever did. Um, this is all very, uh, very new. And that means if the United States is gonna compete with China over the longer term, it cannot do this unilaterally. It cannot do this without allies. Uh, and America's great advantage is, ge is geography. We're a long way away and we don't really threaten most of the countries we are gonna need as our partners. The United States cannot be involved in Asian security on its own, right? It has to have allies like Australia, like South Korea, like Japan, uh, you know, like Singapore, like India as well. Um, and the United States will also, I think, want to have a reasonably close partnership with Europe, even if the nature of that relationship changes uh, over time. Uh, you could also argue that the United States is going to have to rethink its policies towards Russia and possibly in the Middle East as well to not provide too many opportunities. Right? Uh, China and Russia are not necessarily natural allies. They've had difficult relations in the past. Uh, we have done, I think, everything in our power to push the two of them closer together. And if you're really concerned about a long-term rivalry with China, you might start thinking about ways that you could pull that uh, relationship or make that relationship a little less automatic uh, as well. You want to think of ways to do less in Europe so you can focus more of your attention on Asia. And that means Europeans taking more responsibility uh, for their own security. And you might also think longer term about whether or not it makes sense to you know, try and keep Iran in the penalty box forever 
uh, because that just pushes Iran towards uh, China as well. So there are a whole variety of ways in which the United States could play the sort of balance of power politics game uh, more effectively based on the recognition that a unilateral contest between the United States and China uh, is a much less effective way of doing this than working with lots of other countries who have their own interests to be concerned about China's rising power and ambition. Thanks, Steve. I'm going to change tack slightly here um, and take a different type of question. Um, I've got an interesting one from Louis Jacob Rattanen. I'm sorry if I've mispronounced your name. Um, Louis, Louis, would you like to ask this question? I'm putting you on. You should unmute yourself. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me now? Yes, very well. Okay, thank you. Um, good morning. Um, thank you, Professor, for your presentation. So I would just like to ask a question, but it's quite a bit theoretical, but in, but it's still um, central to US-China rivalry and to the issue of international security in general. So here's my question. So considering the increasing Sino-American technological competition, particularly in so-called cognitive technologies or technologies that targets the human mind, so AI, quantum, and biotechnologies, to such extent that their respective militaries are now engaging in a race of weaponizing such technologies, how would this shape the international security landscape? Because given the nature of these mind technologies, where there's now a blurring between object and subject, so is the existing materialist paradigm of IR now in a, inadequate to address their security challenges? So uh, thank you very much. Um, I am not going to be able to answer the sort of really deep conceptual uh, issue that you raised there. It's a, it's a, a really fascinating issue. Just because I haven't thought, uh, thought about it and I wouldn't be able to give you a very uh, compelling answer on the fly. But let me say just a couple of things about it. There's no question that part of this competition uh, is going to be in certain areas of sort of neuroscience and artificial intelligence and a whole panoply of, of advanced technologies. And there are technologies where in some cases the Chinese have, have probably gone further or at least more ambitiously in pursuing them uh, through a lot of what they've done in terms of social control and monitoring and using AI to keep track of populations and things like that. And the other thing to remember is making a lot of those algorithms work depends on data. And when you have a population of a billion people, you have an awful lot of data you can start to accumulate uh, from, from others uh, as well. So one of the other ways in which the United States actually uh, needs allies is to the extent that one needs data, uh, achieving uh, agreements with our European partners, with countries like India, which also has about a billion people, or so, and with others, is in a sense a way of getting access to the information we can use to refine some of these uh, technologies as well. That, however, requires reaching agreements with these other countries on how that, uh, that kind of information can be used. And as you probably know, there's a big disagreement right now between the United States and Europe over, say, digital privacy uh, and how to handle high-tech companies like Amazon and Google and, and others. And you know, if I were, uh, if I knew more about this, I would know exactly how feasible this was. Is but I think you can make an argument that um, the United States and others uh, have a vested interest in cooperating on some uh, norms of, say, broadly speaking, digital architecture and digital governance, precisely so we can reap the benefits of sharing those technologies in artificial intelligence and neuro uh, networks and things like that. And we have now exceeded my knowledge of the subject uh, by at least 25 or 30%. Uh, although I believe Professor Erskine actually knows much more about this than I do. Um, and I, I think we actually have a number of panels as well in, in the next, today and in the next few days that would quite adequately um, give a chance to address some of these questions as well. So Louis, I, um, please stay with us for, for, for the rest of the conference and look out for those panels, I think. You'll get better answers. At, <laughs> I know that this, this was a good way to start the conversation, I think. Um, Steve, if I may, I'd like to recognize a question that was sent very early on by anonymously by one of our participants um, on, on the question of what role do you see for transnational capital 
and you know the the various international organizations and institutions that deal with transnational capital um, within that context of intensified great power competition um, and rivalry that you see as marking the the, the world order going forward. Um. I'm going to say say two things, and and again, I'm more of a sort of an international security person than a political economy person. So uh, what I say should be taken with some grains of salt here. But it, sort of two things. One is that the uh, the backlash I mentioned about uh, hyperglobalization was partly a, a backlash against the notion that you know we were going to make it extraordinarily easy for capital to flow across barriers, never mind the social consequences. And one consequence of that, at least in the West, has been to sort of strengthen the hand of Wall Street and weaken the hand of labor. You know, capital could move to pursue whatever most profitable opportunities were available. Labor can't move nearly as easily. And so if you're in a factory working in the middle of America, the factory can decide to move to Indonesia because it's cheaper to manufacture things there. The worker can't just get up and get on a plane and go get a job in Indonesia. Uh, in quite the same way. And some of what we're seeing now of trying to reverse those tendencies, make it a little bit more difficult, what Joe Biden has called, you know, sort of a foreign economic policy for the middle class, I think is is a reaction uh, to some of that uh, as well. Um, let me, what was the, there was a second part of the question, um, but it, in, the, in the context of, uh, now I think maybe I'll just stop there. Uh, and leave it at that, that I, I do think you're, you're, we are, oh yes, I remember the second part. The, the other part is that, as I suggested, if what we end up is a, uh, a set of sort of bounded orders, and I agreed with your point that these are going to be overlapping, these are not mutually exclusive, we're going to have all those things simultaneously, the relatively thick orders that exist in a Chinese-centered part and an American-centered part will be where the densest connections of capital uh, are. So the United States will continue to trade and invest most, uh, it seems to me, with its partners in Europe, its partners in Asia, as it has in the past. And in a sense, there'll be a, two separate constellations where the transnational capital will be, be most concentrated there for political reasons and less going uh, across the sort of US sphere and Chinese sphere. But that's just pretty speculative on my part. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, I'm going to, we have a couple of minutes left and I'm going to give the opportunity um, to one of our participants to ask the two interesting questions that they've posed themselves. Um, please introduce yourself um, first, as I can't tell what your name is by your um, Zoom label. Please go ahead. XHA85. Um, thank you, Stephen. My name is Abdurrahman Shah. Um, my, I have two questions, basically. Uh, the first question is that why the world, especially the developed world, failed to foresee the coming of the crisis because of COVID-19? Um, for me, this question is pertinent, big, both in terms of natural sciences and social sciences. Uh, from natural sciences perspective, with all the scientific and advancement that we have, why couldn't we see like you know this scale of crisis, health crisis coming? And in terms of social sciences, you know why couldn't IR theories, uh, theories of political science, foresee or uh, you know um, predict this kind of crisis? Um, I mean happening again and again, like, you know, in 13th century, two world wars, and the wars happen, and, you know, again, after the war, the theory, the conceptualization starts, like, you know, why it happened, why couldn't it, we predict that, you know? So this question become um, again coming, you know, isn't it a failure of, like, you know, natural sciences, social sciences? The second part of my question is that, why do you see the future of world politics post pandemic politics through the prism of US China rivalry. I mean strictly to US China rivalry. So these are my questions. Thanks. Um, okay, so uh, first of all, there on the first question, why didn't we see this coming? Well some people did. Um, and uh, you know, the most famously Laurie Garrett, who wrote a book at least 20 years ago, uh, I think with the title something like The Coming Global Pandemic, saying 
something like what we are now living through, it was going to happen sooner or later. And she pointed back, of course, to the you know 1918-19 influenza uh, epidemic, but also that there had been these more, more recent uh, developments, whether it was the uh, the AIDS pandemic uh, or uh, you know SARS, etc. Um, and I think part of the problem is we got a little bit complacent because those other uh, diseases that had crossed species, had gone from animals to humans, um, turned out to be either controllable by controlling behavior, right? You could limit your vulnerability or your uh, exposure to AIDS by changing practices, uh, or we were successful at containing them. Uh, SARS caused problems in Asia, but did not really go global. Ebola has caused uh, lots of suffering in Africa, but did not go global. Uh, as well. So in a sense, people may have gotten somewhat uh, uh, complacent about it. Although I would also remind everybody that the Obama administration took this very seriously. I have friends who worked on these issues and they understood what Lori Garrett was worried about, that in a globalized world where people were traveling all over all of the time, something like this was going to happen and you wanted to be able to get on top of it as quickly as possible. And that was the way you kept it uh, under control, as some countries like Australia have done remarkably effectively, uh, some others as well. Um, and uh, in my view, the Trump administration uh, completely blew this. Uh, they didn't take it seriously. Um, they did not follow the instructions and guidance that they had been handed by the Obama administration and uh, pretended this was going to go away. And my country is now dealing uh, with all of the consequences uh, of those mistakes as well. Uh, your second question, why do I focus so much on the US-China relationship? Because I think that will be the single most important thing shaping the character of world politics. It is by no means the only thing uh, that is going to do it. Uh, shifts in climate, independent of what happens to Sino-American relations are gonna have a big impact on world politics. Regional disagreements uh, are gonna shape politics in the Middle East, in Africa, in Latin America. Um, what happens to populism in places like Brazil or Hungary or Poland? Those are all uh, important as well. So there's a lot going on here and I haven't even brought up demography, which I think is one of these you know, big questions that once you start thinking about it, clearly has enormous impact. Nonetheless, all of those uh, issues are going to be very heavily shaped, it seems to me, by uh, what the United States chooses to do or not to do, what China chooses to do or not to do, and whether or not uh, their relationship continues to sort of spiral and become increasingly acrimonious, possibly conflictive, although I certainly hope not, and I don't think that's inevitable, or whether or not those two countries are able to say, look, we're gonna compete with each other, but we understand there are limits to what we can accomplish. And we also understand that we're gonna have to spend some part of our diplomatic agenda, working on those issues on which we really do have to reach agreement. Uh, that's the, the, it seems to me, the big question going forward. Steve, thank, thank you so much. And, and thank you for fielding so many questions um, of, and of such a wide variety as well. Um, to our audience, I'm afraid we've run clean out of time in, in this session. Um, but let, please let me thank Professor Stephen Walt of Harvard um, for both his opening address and for engaging so thoroughly um, with the questions that we were able to field in this session. Uh, Steve, that, that was uh, um, the best kind of keynote uh, you offered as a broad ranging, big picture overview of the world today and, and um, what you think the world would be like tomorrow. Um, you've offered a stimulating conceptual framework um, as well as very suggestive um, future trends. So I think you put us well, you know, in the frame of mind for five intensive days of intellectual exchange and engagement. And thank you also for the reminder that, you know, in these difficult and challenging times, it is incumbent upon us as international studies scholars to pick up the mantle of our responsibilities to not only do research, but also to engage and to think deeply about these questions and problems. So please will you join me in thanking um, Steve for, for setting us on the right tracks for OSIS 2020. Uh, thank you very much.
And it is my final duty to remind you that uh, we will have a little break at this point. And the first panel of today will begin at 11 o'clock Australian Eastern Time, which is in about 25 minutes. So thank you very much. Take care and see you in a panel. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. My pleasure. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>